perhaps the most memorable encounter I've had with anyone. So what we try to look at is we do break it down by channel and we break it down by campaign because everyone wants to know those numbers and they are still numbers that you should look at. But we also just have like an aggregated, here's the amount of total ad spend you've spent on Facebook, Google, Amazon, eBay, Wayfair, like all of them. And here's the amount of revenue you made. Here's your overall ROI. Welcome to the Own Your Commerce podcast, where leading experts, brands, and innovators reveal strategies for e-commerce growth. I'm your host, Jay Myers, and this show is brought to you by Bold Commerce. Hey, listeners, welcome to another Own Your Commerce episode. I have with me today, Andrew Meffetin, who most people just call MAF <laughs> uh, for short. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of an agency called Blue Tusker. And he's got over 15 years in experience in e-commerce and not only managing brands, but working in them. He's worked in-house uh, in a lot of different capacities, mainly around helping brands uh, drive, drive growth. Uh, we took a bit of a different approach with this episode. He's written and spoken at a lot of conferences, and I just took the titles of each one of his talks and we dove into them in each of these episodes. So one of the one of the topics was, you know, operating how to operate an eight-figure e-commerce marketing department with one employee, um, paid advertising attribution. You know why e-commerce digital marketing has gone traditional and how, and how to measure it, structuring Google Ads, ad shopping. Ad, the list goes on. E-commerce SEO. Uh, why an e-commerce omni-channel approach is all sellers will be marketing in the future. So we took each talk that he's done and we kind of dove into it for five minutes. So you kind of get, <laughs> you get the meat of basically everything he's done in his life condensed into just this podcast. So basically what I'm saying is this is a podcast you don't want to miss. So that's all I got to say. Let's uh, dive into it. Here we go. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been long time coming and I know <laughs> you've gone through some hoop scheduling this, but I really, really appreciate you being here. Can you give us a bit of background, who you are and what you do and, and your story before Blue Tusker? Yeah, sure. All right. So we're going right at it. <laughs> so, I'm jumping, jumping right into it, man. <laughs> Let's Nobody wants to hear small talk. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Andrew Maff. I am the founder of Blue Tusker. We're a full service digital marketing company for e-commerce sellers. I've been in the e-commerce industry pretty much for, I think, about 15 years now. When I started, my father actually owned an e-commerce business and he actually needed help in his warehouse. And I was like, that sounds boring. I've always wanted to learn marketing. And he was like, if you help me in the warehouse, I will have our marketing guys like have you as an intern. And I was like, cool. So that's kind of how I started. Then fast forward to, at the, I think I was like, at that time, I was probably like 16, 17, somewhere in there. Fast forward to college. I was in a band. I was a drummer. And they found out I had a marketing background. So outside of being the drummer, my job was to market and promote our band. So I started doing a lot of concert promotion, stuff like that. Other bands started asking me to help them do their shows, even if we weren't on it. And after a while, I started to really like figure out how to do it. So that was when I actually started my first company. And it was concert promotion slash like just overall like venue marketing because a lot of venues would ask me to promote just shows they had coming through. Some of them, like if we had like a jazz guy come through, they started to realize like, hey, can you help us like promote trivia night and stuff like that? So it kind of started getting into like venues slash like hospitality a little bit. And I was like, all right, this isn't, I hated the music industry. It was crap. So I actually <laughs> merged that agency into kind of a focus a little bit on the retail hospitality side with a family member of mine who had a similar concept. And basically, a lot of the retail started to pick back up. And I was able to cater a little bit to that because I had so much knowledge of it from before. Realized that working family wasn't great. Left there. Went in kind of in-house at another agency a few years ago. Not a few years ago. Wow, at this point, it's probably like six, seven years ago. Um, <laughs> was there, for, yeah, was there for like <laughs> two, three years. Basically, started the agency with basically, I call him a partner of mine. We sold that in late 2019, and I started Blue Tusker in early 2020, and now here I am on this podcast. <laughs> two things, two, two <laughs> your whole life has led to this exact moment right here. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> yes. You took a left turn one time and here you are today, 15 years later. Yeah. It is, life does go like that sometimes. You yeah. know what? Bold wouldn't exist actually if one day I was walking down a hall, I looked, if I looked left instead of right, I saw this ad for, it was for Bible camp, but I ended up doing archery there, fell in love with archery. My parents opened an archery store, started an archery online store. 
that turned into bold. We do apps. But had I not seen that when I was 11 years old, I sometimes think like, wow, that's crazy. If I looked the other way and didn't see that advertisement and didn't start doing archery, I would have like, I wouldn't be married to the woman I have. So like, yeah. but here you are, here you are today, <laughs> this moment. <laughs> Two things kind of stand that's out nuts. in that. One is, I think you're the first person I've heard that has had a parent growing up in e-commerce because, you know, e-commerce is still relatively, I mean, it's not, yeah. it's not. Actually, it was, so it was crazy. Old. So they sold like shocks for your car. So like suspension basically. And they were, he bought the company from this guy, him and a couple partners. And they were mainly B2B. So they were targeting like car dealerships and stuff like that. And that was like right when the internet was starting to pick up. And they were like, no, we want to take this thing online. They were actually invited to be, I believe it was like the sole seller of car shocks on Amazon. And they turned it down because they thought it wouldn't work. (laughs) And so... Totally missed that one. I mean, they scaled it. The company did great. My dad ended up exiting and just sold off his shares to his partners. It's still around today, last I checked. But yeah, he was, they were definitely right at the beginning there. Because even back then, my job yeah. was helping on the e-commerce side. I didn't really do too much of anything with the dealerships. That's crazy. A lot of people might not know. So I like I had an exact same experience. So I started selling our archery stuff online in 98. And mm-hmm. in 2001, started actually doing a ton online and Amazon reached out one day and said, we'd love you to be the archery section on Amazon. And I didn't pursue it at all either. I didn't think anything would come from it (laughs) because it's hard to believe now, but back then, like Amazon was, was really nothing like eBay was what everyone was selling on. And yeah, um, it's, it's changed so much. The other thing that stood out was the fact that you were in a band. I've had a few people (laughs) on the podcast that were part of a band. And I think there's something to be said for the life lessons and marketing skills you learn to promote a band because you're doing events, real life, you've got merch, you've got offline, online, you've got community, you've got a product. Like if you can market a band, you could probably market anything. So, you know, if someone oh, applies God. and they have on I would agree with that. If they have <laughs> if they have on their resume, if they have on their resume, like was in a band for five years and helped promote it definitely consider <clears throat> yeah. that person. So. I know, right? Like when we had done that, it was actually, it was like right when Facebook was getting bigger and it was now no longer just colleges and stuff. And so I had the ability to just like right at the beginning of social media and start figuring it out. Like what can we do here? And there were so many backdoor hacks to like grow engagement and grow followers, which you are long gone since then. But growing a band at the start of like social starting to pick up was real easy. And then as it started to die off, it obviously got a lot harder. <laughs> and then Facebook realized they could monetize it and charge you to reach your own exactly. audience and yeah. everything else. Okay, yeah. so that leads a little bit into Blue Tusker. So Blue Tusker, what does the company do? So we are a full service digital marketing company for e-commerce sellers. So basically, we're almost like an outsourced marketing department for a lot of the sellers that we work with. And is there like a certain size of GMV annual that is a good fit or? A little all over. I mean, yeah. So we do kind of have like a bit of an a la carte approach because sometimes going solely off like annual revenue is a little difficult because sometimes you, we have a couple sellers that are just, you know, brand new, just starting off, but they're very well backed. So they have the capital to be able to put into certain strategies, but we also kind of because we have that a la carte approach, we can kind of like say like, all right, with where you're at, you should probably just start here. And then we can add in more stuff as time goes on. But for the clients where we basically are like their entire marketing department, they're usually in like the right now, they kind of average in like the three to six million a year range, give or take. Okay. So the way I wanted to structure this, that's a good bit of background is for those listening, when I reached out to Andrew way back when to schedule this, what we do with a lot of our guests is we always ask, you know, are there any topics or things you want to talk on and then we kind of build a bit of <laughs> build a bit of an outline and instead of topics you sent a list of talks you have given and presentations yeah. <laughs> so and you know what every every single one i think i kept most of them in i might have taken out one or two but they all were i thought very intriguing and i thought it would be fun to obviously we we don't have time for you to give the whole talk on all these topics but spark notes version know, 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. The summary.com <laughs> version. But some of them, I think a lot of our listeners, you know, when I listen to a podcast, I, if I can take away a few takeaways from a podcast, that's kind of a win for me. So my hope is kind of maybe we'll touch on some of these and I can almost guarantee people listening are probably going to have some takeaways here. But <laughs> when I read through these titles, I just, there's something here for everyone. So all right, let's, um, let's make it fun. So let's, <laughs> you'll pick the topic, I'll go off. And if you say like that didn't provide enough value, I'll go deeper into it. If not, then we can go on to the next one. <laughs> Sounds good. It's too bad this isn't live. We can get like thumbs up, thumbs down. Continue. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, the first one's interesting. This was the title of the talk, how to operate an eight figure e-commerce marketing department with one employee. I bet yeah. you there's no one here that wouldn't like to know how to do that. So what was this so, all about? All right, this one, yeah, this will be tough on a SparkNotes version. So, all right, so I gave you my background, but I skipped over a couple like places I was at in between there, right? So I did go in-house at two different e-commerce companies. Both of them were eight figures, minimum plus kind of thing. They did between like 10 and 20, give or take. And in both cases, I was the only marketing person there. Mm-hmm. And only in one case... Did we have an agency? And to be honest, I didn't want them. <laughs> but the guy I was working for at the time was like, no, you have to, we're keeping them. And I was like, fine. So this is kind of like how Blue Tusker started because I you know, was able to figure out like, okay, I know how to process stuff in marketing without it being like templated. Like, cause that's, that's mm. the big issue with a lot of agencies, right? Is like, they basically come in with these templates and they basically just do exactly what they know to do and what works. And if it doesn't work, that's on you and you end up losing on it. And you end up, you know, if it's paid advertising, they end up losing a ton of money on it. Cause you just tried to shove you a square peg into a round hole kind of thing. Yeah. So basically <laughs> that talk's always really interesting. Cause I always start it one way and it ends completely in a different direction than I wanted <laughs> it to go in. But a lot of it to me is around what most marketers don't focus on, which is like the project management side of things and being aware of either A, what you're good at, B, what you enjoy doing, and then C, basically like how you can be knowledgeable enough in a certain area that you're dangerous, that you can just oversee a freelancer. So mm-hmm. when the first place I was at, this was actually right before we had started the last agency. And we had, I think, three or four freelancers give or take. And then that was it. And they were doing, I think like between 10 and 12 million when I got there. At the time they had some agencies. I'm a horrible graphic designer. So that was the first thing I outsourced. I was like, I need a great graphic designer because I can't do that. But then it really came down to the project management side. So I'm a big fan of Asana. That's just because it's one I've used for years and I'm comfortable with it. There's a ton out there. So that's just the one that I always mention. But basically what I've done is over the years, I've built out like templates within Asana of the entire process of how Mm. things should be done. But essentially what happens is as time goes on, things change, right? Like like I was talking about earlier, Facebook has wildly different than it once was. So how you, you know, read data on scheduling posts and when you should post and like certain hashtags you should go after or if you're doing influencer marketing, something like that, constantly changing. So those templates are essentially live. So what happens is every time I learn something new, the first thing I do is I go back into those templates, adjust it so that next time I have to do it, I am now pre-prepared in basically what it is that I need to do. And so what I started to do as time went on was I would look at each and it was almost like an SOP, right? So it was basically just like a complete, it was basically a live document of like how to do marketing sort of. And so what I would do is all those little subtasks of like, we use social media as an example. So looking up which days are better, looking up which times are working better, looking up what type of content's working better, pulling the reporting, how to pull the reporting, where to put the reporting, all that fun stuff. All that at a certain time, I would do it myself. I would figure it out. And then I would go, great. I'm going to get a VA. I'm going to do a... Now I used to use Loom. I do a Loom video, show them exactly how to do it. And now it's gotten to the point where all I'm doing is reading the data, analyzing it, saying, okay, we need to do this. For social, at the time, I would just hand it off to my designer on what type of creative we wanted. They would create it. And then I had a VA that would schedule it and I would just oversee the whole concept. So we didn't have any other internal employees. There was no one else on salary. We only had like four or five freelancers. I think Two of them you could theorize were full-time, give or take, but obviously they're hourly. So if I didn't need them, it didn't happen. And it really comes down to being able to adjust. So like right now at Blue Tusker, we have the same concept. We have all these templates that we have in Asana. And every time we learn something new, I adjust it in the template. But the thing that 
I think where a lot of agencies mess up is they stick to that template and they act like it's gold. Like it's that's what we have to do for this to work. But every single seller I've ever worked with, every product, every category, it's all so wildly different that you can't just go like black and white on like this works, this works because it's never the same. So usually what happens is right before we even start, we'll prep those templates and we'll do a complete audit of, okay, based on this business, we need to adjust here and here. We need to look out for these things instead of just trying to shove them into a certain area. But like the project management side and then being able to find quality freelancers on stuff that you know that you're not good at. Like I always find that that's a big issue is no one ever admits that they're bad at stuff. And like for me, it was like, I can't design for my life. So that was the first thing I went after. But basically like just, it's hard to do without the slides. <laughs> but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but like, I'm pulling ahead. stuff from it. I'm pulling stuff from it. Yeah. This is, I mean, well, one, two things I would say already, like is I think a lot of people who own a business, they have this mindset that they want to get good at everything. They want to, I don't know, for whatever reason, that's part of the businesses. They, they, you know, like they like challenges. So they're like, I want to get good at graphic design. I want to get good at SEO. I want to get good at paid. I want to get good at whatever it is. But that's actually that philosophy is not good. You should, and there's a lot of data and even books about this now, like this concept of like, you should be a well-rounded person. You actually shouldn't. You should focus on your strengths and be the best at, it's better to have someone who's like the best at something and know what you're strong at, know what you're weak at and find people for the gaps. Yeah, like know enough to be dangerous, basically. Right, yeah. What you don't want is you don't want a whole bunch of people that are well-rounded and a little bit good at everything, right? Yes. Like you want mm-hmm. people who are really, really good at something and to know it and to have that emotional maturity <laughs> to know what they're not good at and what <laughs> they are good at. The thing that stood out to me when I read this title was I was reading a book. I think it was from this book, but don't quote me on it. There's a, a book called The 12 Week Year, which is a fantastic book. And I'm, I believe it was in this one, but I read a lot and I sometimes get them mixed up. But there was a guy who he studied the effect of marketing at companies. And I don't know, he looked at like a hundred different companies and they, in the end, determined that about 90% of revenue leads, conversions, whatever the metric was, came from about 10% of effort. The problem was companies didn't know which 10% of effort was converting and was actually working. So like right now, for anyone listening, probably 90% of your customers are coming from 10% of your efforts. And what we really should do, and when I look at this, it's like, you know, how to operate an eight-figure with a one-person employee, that one person could probably be really good at that 10% if they knew exactly what the 10% was and go all in on it and forget about the rest. It's not the 80-20, it's 90-10. Would you say that that's true with like the brands you worked with and, and some of your clients now that yeah, so it's, that kind of gets into it. I think it's another one of the talks I sent you is like the attribution tracking, which is kind of a pain right now. And that mm. kind of comes down to being able to track what's working and what's not. Because that's, to me, it's kind of a loaded question. And it's a mm. constant battle that we have, especially as to, especially since the iOS change and that became a whole issue. But so I was saying like, you know, template stuff, blah, blah. blah. We also have the same concept within a Google Drive. So we've built out all the folders that I've ever needed in a marketing department, all the reports I've ever needed and templated them out. And then we adjust them as time goes on. So I duplicate the entire folder and we essentially just drop an entire marketing department in a client's like business, give them access to the folder, they own it. And then we just keep everything running for them. I always like to give them the opportunity that like, if, hey, if you just don't like me as a person and you want to go somewhere else, then you can just leave and take everything with you. But like to that 10% thing, like what I would do as, and what I do with our clients now is I look at, we have a couple reports that are like what I live and die by. And it's my paid advertising, like week over week comparisons. And then my overall marketing everything that we're doing month over month comparisons, whereas we've got it broken down by like quarter over quarter and year over year and all that stuff. And I I love data. I like to see like there's proof behind what's working. I hate having calls with someone and speculating over like what we think's happening. And you know, there's this and there's this like, look, there's numbers. Like, let's just look at the numbers and go by that. And so one of the things that I've always talked about, especially on the attribution side, and I actually just read a report the other day. I can't remember where it was. It was on LinkedIn or something. But this guy did a report where a lot of B2B companies, right, they'll have that like option of it'll be a drop down. And when they fill out their form, it'll be like, where'd you hear about us kind of thing? And people will select. Well, he thought he goes, well, I'm going to do this time is I'm going to not make it a drop down. I'm gonna let him just type it in. 
and I want to mm-hmm. see what these people say. And so he went and read it one by one by one, but then cross-referenced it with what Google Analytics was saying. And so that's where it becomes kind of an issue because he was saying that, okay, this person, according to Google Analytics, came in from organic. But what really happened was this person responded and said, like, I met this guy at a conference and he told me about you. And so I looked you guys up. You're going to now think, oh, I got to put more money into SEO because more organic is doing really well. Be like, no, he actually searched your brand name and knew about you ahead of time. So that's the other side is if you solely look at organic and you're not separating out the searches for your brand name, now you've got to figure out like, okay, what terms am I ranking for? Or is it really brand awareness? So then if it's brand awareness, you got to look into all the brand awareness aspects. So like I see a ton of clients that'll get a ton of sales or we have a couple B2B commerce clients we work with and they'll get a ton of leads from Facebook. But what'll happen is after a while, they'll see like, oh yeah, but we're getting customers from Google ads or from organic. So we should put more money there. Like, no, no, no. Because what's happening is you're driving all the traffic, the top of funnel traffic from Facebook, but then they're kicking tires for a little while and then they're searching your name and they're just clicking on your brand name. So you're getting all the brand awareness and then they're coming in. So that's kind of when like your question about like, do you see that it's the 10%? Yes, but at the same time, you have to know that the other 90% is probably assisting that 10%. Interesting. Or funneling into it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's your, well, I think you kind of covered what the next talk was, was uh, (laughs) paid advertising attribution, why e-commerce digital marketing has gone traditional and how to measure it. That kind of that yeah. falls under what you were just talking about. So I totally like, okay, if you're in traditional marketing, right? So when I refer to traditional marketing, I'm thinking like radio, TV, that fun stuff, right? You have never ever had a company ask, how much money did I make on that billboard? You don't mm-hmm. know. You can't tell. And to be honest, with the way that tracking is going now, it is very difficult to get an actual number. There's a ton of attribution software out there you can use for some of our B2B e-commerce clients, like HubSpot's got some stuff in there. You can sometimes manipulate Google Analytics and the new uh, GA4 that they have that you can kind of do that that way. But it's still not perfect. And it's still not exactly Mm -hmm. what everyone wants. And everyone, I think, is still so used to these black and white results that we used to get years ago that they still expect that. But at the end of the day, like marketing is a lot more than just pressing a button and getting a result. It's developing a brand. It's telling a story. And it's basically building your own community and getting people to come in and counting every little tiny thing that comes in becomes really difficult. So like one of those spreadsheets we look at specifically on the paid ad side, I look at, and we have this issue with Amazon sellers constantly because Amazon's taken over. So we've actually seen that sometimes, let's say, you know, just for the sake of easy math, you're making $100 a month on Shopify, super easy math, and you're making uh, $200 a month on Amazon, we increase ad spend on Facebook by 10%. And so we would expect to see $110 on our website. But what I've actually seen is I'll get like $105 on my website and then maybe like $210 on Amazon. And it's because people will sometimes go straight to Amazon to see if you're available. Sometimes they'll go to your site and leave and go to Amazon to see if you're available. So if you look at just one channel alone, you're actually not painting the entire picture. A lot of sellers look at Shopify as like one business, Amazon's another business, eBay is another business, Walmart's another business, but it's all your business at the end of the day. It's all your brand. It's no different than if you were in 10, 15 different retail stores. So what we try to look at is we do break it down by channel and we break it down by campaign because everyone wants to know those numbers and they are still numbers that you should look at. But we also just have like an aggregated, here's the amount of total ad spend you've spent on Facebook, Google, Amazon, eBay, Wayfair, like all of them. And here's the amount of revenue you made. Here's your overall ROI. That's the number you should be keeping an eye on most importantly. And then when you go, okay, we're doing good. I want to spend some more money. Then you kind of go like, all right, let's go channel by channel and think about the customer journey and the funnel. Because a lot of people always say like, let's put it in Google ads because it's a little bit more middle of funnel. But a lot of times if you're building enough brand awareness, you should actually probably be putting it in social ads because it's feeding your Google ads. So you'll see Google ads go up sometimes, whereas your social ads will actually just kind of maintain if you don't touch them for too long or they'll tank because your creative gets bad. Okay, this leads perfectly into what I have as your next one here, which is structuring, <laughs> this was the title of your talk, structuring Google ads, Google ads shopping <laughs> and search campaigns to scale your e-commerce business. There's probably a lot of people throwing away a lot of money with ads and probably a oh, lot of yeah. people winning and making a lot of money. What's the difference? What are the ones that are winning, doing differently? They know 
their audience. I think the ones that do the best are the ones that know their audience. I get a lot of times I'll deal with a seller who will be like, Facebook ads doesn't work for me. And then I'll look at what their product is. And I don't need to know a lot about their business to figure out which channel is going to work best. I just need to know the product because then I can figure out who it is we're targeting. And they'll turn around and go, Facebook doesn't work for me. And I go, that's not, you know, in a lot of cases, that's not true. There's no way that that's true. And they speculate like, oh, it doesn't work. And I've had agencies try before and blah, blah. And what they don't really think about is knowing their audience and how difficult or how easy it may be to attract them. So on Facebook, you can narrow stuff down and get them to convert better. But at the end of the day, like to get Facebook to actually they claim to leave the learning phase, you got to get 50 conversions within a week for one audience that you're targeting. So you got to spend a good amount to get enough data to figure out what's working. And sometimes you get these sellers that are just like, I'm going to put like $10, $20 a day into Facebook ads. And it honestly, like, I think that that's the problem with a lot of agencies is that they don't just tell people like, okay, here's the facts based on what Facebook publishes and what's going to work and what's not going to work. Can you spend $10, $20 a day? Absolutely. You can target link clicks and you can get as much traffic to your site as possible and hope that it's optimized enough to convert. But if you're targeting conversions, you're probably going to have to increase your spend a little bit. So just a quick question on that before we go on, because so spending like if someone thinking, you know, the number could be $20, it could be more whatever, but spending $20 a day for a month, $600, you're better off spending, compressing that into a shorter period. Like take whatever you want to spend in a month and compress that into seven days or five days. You're saying Facebook will get better data and then be able to serve ads to a better audience. Is that Yeah. I mean, this is the beauty of Facebook is like, it does a lot of the heavy lifting for you. The stuff that you actually need to really focus on is the creative. Like, what are you showing and who are you showing it to? And as long as you give Facebook enough budget to work with, which is always like, I get so much crap for saying that because it's such a cop out for an agency to say like, just spend more money, give Facebook more money. But like at the end of the day, like that's just how the platform works. I didn't make it. I'm not Zuckerberg. If I was, I would fix it for you. I'm sorry, but I can't. So it kind of is what it is. But a lot of sellers, they'll go straight at converting, targeting purchases, which makes a lot of sense if that's what you want. But if you can't give Facebook enough data within the period that they ask, they say 50 conversions within a seven day period. It's not entirely true. You can definitely leave the learning phase prior. It's sometimes dependent on the audience and what you're running, but you still got to get something for Facebook to figure out what's working. And so you can back it up and do add to cart, or you could back it up again and target landing page views. There's a lot of people that don't like that process of like backing it up and targeting more top of funnel stuff like that. I try to do it as fast as possible. Like as soon as I have even enough conversions, okay, let's flip it. So if a conversion is just a click in this case, or if a conversion is an add to cart in this case, like, okay, flip it. Like don't let it sit there for too long. Because it honestly, you get tire kickers, you get people that aren't what you want. But a lot of the times to kind of go back to your original question of like, you know, where does it go wrong? It's just a matter of knowing where your audience is, how to talk to them, and then knowing how the platform works. Yeah, makes sense. Sorry, I cut you off before you were going to talk about Google. I think it was shopping or mm. some of the difference. It, like- yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a similar problem that people will say like, Google doesn't work for me. And in some cases that can be true. So for example, like people in apparel, people that do premium products, so like a luxury brand or something like that, Google's really tough because shopping, the people that are searching for white t-shirt are not looking for a premium t-shirt. They're looking for just a white t-shirt that they need. And if you're running search ads on white t-shirt, you're going to spend an arm and a leg. So you kind of are running out of options there. Obviously, you can display ads, which are significantly more top of funnel and you're paying just for impressions. So that gets expensive. So Google is one where I go, it is very possible that Google doesn't work for you. However, if you're doing a lot on Facebook, you definitely want to be doing at least a minimum amount for your branded ad just so that once you get competitors in there, if they start bidding on your brand name before you do, it makes your cost per click go up just to try to kick them out. That's interesting because a lot of people will not bid on their own brand thinking that they're throwing away money because they rank first for it anyway. But Exactly. But, yeah. But so, now there's four... AdWords before you even get to organic results. So you're yeah. recommending still make sure you secure your brand spot. Yeah, because usually what we'll do is on Google, obviously you have the same concept, right? You can target conversions and stuff like that. For branded campaigns, I usually just do target impression share. So it's kind of like, just make sure I'm owning the spot 
I don't want anyone else in my way. And what we've seen happen a lot is if, especially if you're not like a perfect fit for Google ads, chances are you're, that means you're a pretty good fit for social ads. And so when you start putting yourself out into prospecting world like that and your competitors start seeing what you're doing, they start going, oh, these guys must be getting traction. I see their ads all the time. So they start bidding on your brand name and doing a competitive search ad. And if you weren't already owning that spot and kind of keeping that like Google ad relevancy score at a decent rate, now you have to go in and try to bid out your competitor, which starts off pretty expensive until you can actually kick them out, which you can never really kick them out, but outrank them basically. Okay. E-commerce SEO, the exact process and tech stack I use to explode organic traffic and improve <laughs> ROI. I, so I please someone, give away your exact stack. I was uh, talking to someone to do a conference and they asked us to like really fluff up the titles. And I was like, oh, I hate <laughs> fluffy titles. So I just like dropped in like high volume seller and explode and skyrocket your results. And <laughs> tries. I hate that stuff, but thank you for still reading it. <laughs> so, all right. So we're SEMrush partners. So we use SEMrush. There's a ton of other stuff out there. We still look at Ahrefs. We look at SpyFu. Like we kind of cross-reference them, but SEMrush is kind of the main one we use. So you use SEMrush. We'll use that for our keyword research of what it is we want to target. What we try to do is that's, again, going to be kind of dependent on the company, but we look at, obviously, search volume. So is this thing even worth going after? The, oh man, I'm drawing, the competitor, I forgot the term. It's basically how much competition there is on the term. And then we also look at cost per click. And so I always track all that stuff for every keyword we want to go after. Then you can look into the keyword and get an idea of, okay, what are people searching? So are they asking questions around this term? Are they looking for answers about something about this term, right? So it gives me an idea about what an article should be about that we should be writing. Then we'll take that topic concept and basically I'll put it directly into Google and see like, okay, what are the top three to five articles that are answering this question already? on basically exactly what I want to be ranking for here. I will take those articles and basically now I'm going to take the concept. I'm going to take some of the things that we want to talk about, obviously the terms that we want to rank for and those top articles and send them over to my writer. So the writer takes all that information and starts to obviously compile an article. It's got to obviously be different from the current ones. I want basically every piece of information from those four or five articles that is different at all, all in ours. And then I want to know how many images were they using Okay, great. Let's use at least the same amount, if not a couple more to break it up. How many H2 tags did they use? How many links did they have? And basically kind of get an idea of where it's at. Then one of our godsends that I love is SEO Surfer. So essentially, you can actually take the article you wrote, put it in there, and actually put in the articles that you are that you're trying to rank against. And it will tell you, use more of this term, put in more images, use a couple more bullet points or something like that. It will literally tell you like how to rank better on it then it will compare them side to side. And then you obviously go from there and we'll use Grammarly and all that fun stuff to make sure that it sounds correct. And we'll upload it, let it sit there. That's Surfer, Surfer, S sorry, I just wanted to make S sure I get that. SEO Surfer. Okay, and their website is Surfer SEO. Surfer SEO. SEO. Okay. Hey, Surfer SEO, I right. say backwards. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think their URL is surferseo.com, but it might okay. be SEO Surfer. Yeah, okay. I just want to make sure I got the right one here. That one. Then, so then you publish it. And then we put it on a timer. So then we let it, I will go straight into Google Search Console and I'm impatient. So I'll just go to straight to Search Console and be like, no, index it now. Force them to index it. Then we wait about, right now we have it at about a four to six week timer. So basically like we'll, we have Asana, we'll create a task about four to six weeks out to check it again. And what we can do now is we can see like, all right, what page are we on currently? And so what we'll do is we'll take a look at it and then we will actually take it and be able to put it back into SEO server to see if anything's changed that it thinks maybe now we should adjust. But that's when we go in and then we just kind of, then it's more of an art. So then it's like, you know what? We're going to add another 200, 300 words to this. Let's change out a couple images, things like that. Almost every time I have seen that article improve. So what we'll do is we want to make sure that the products are linking to there. So obviously the products can benefit from some of it. We'll want to add in, you always want to make sure that the blog itself is optimized for something. So obviously everyone's going to prefer direct to getting a sale. I prefer like just get their email. You can get them later, you know, set up different retargeting ads that are based on whatever it is, the topic that you wrote. So you know that you're hitting the right audience, things like that. 
But that whole process has been like a godsend for us. And that's been perfect. The one thing that we try to really keep an eye on too is not just organic traffic. Because that's another thing we see a lot is like agencies will be like, we, you know, 10x your organic traffic. It's awesome. But like, if you can't convert those people, like who cares? So Mm -hmm. I've seen sellers that have had like some serious traffic growth and organic sales are still like flat. And so we'll focus on different aspects within the article that like, what can we do to actually get them to a product or what kind of campaigns can we put together on a paid advertising side that can retarget people that are looking at those types of topics. And then we still do like the backlink approach. We, to a certain extent, we don't do any like the directories or profiles or stuff like that where it's a crapshoot to do that kind of stuff. But we'll do like guest posting or, you know, kind of like backlink sharing with relevant companies. And so right now we've been using BuzzStream for that as well as just organically searching. Yeah. I stumbled across one. I'm curious if you use, it's called Answer the Public. Have you? Yeah. Have you so when we that? do topic research, actually I have That's my a- thing open right here. So we do topic research. We have Answer the Public. There's also one called Also Asked. There's, if you put it into Google, it's called Keyword Shitter. I didn't name it. That's what it's called. <laughs> and it's hilarious. There's also Spark Toro. And then we also use exploding topics, which can sometimes be a little rough, but it's the one that like, it will tell you like, hey, there's all of a sudden a ton of search volume about this. So Mm. if we're right before we do keyword research, we'll look at that if there's anything relevant for someone we're working with. And then we'll be like, ooh, let's hop on that before there's a ton of articles about it. This is awesome. That's some great, great resources and great strategy in there. I wouldn't make fun of your title, Exploding Organic Traffic. (laughs) Got good content in there. Thanks. I got three more to go here before we run out of time. But (laughs) this one, I think, I listened to a podcast you were on a while ago, and I I feel like this is an area you're passionate about, but it's just the why an e-commerce omni-channel approach is how all sellers will be marketing in the future. First of all, what do you mean by that? And what's some strategies here or takeaways for brands listening? Yeah, this one gets me heated. So. This is, it's such a, it's such a common thing. I said this a little bit earlier too, is like, I see so many sellers that treat their Amazon business as one thing and their Shopify or whatever they're on is another thing. And their eBay is one thing and it's just all different. And I'm like, why are we so focused on individual channels? If this was traditional marketing and this was retail, we wouldn't be like, get Costco this packaging and get Kohl's this packaging. And like, you wouldn't change at all. You would have the same concept. And so I see a lot of sellers that will be like, okay, I want to put a ton of focus on on Amazon because that's where I'm making a lot of money. And I'm going to kind of half-ass my Shopify because it's expensive to do that. And I, I feel like I just need it. And then, you know what? We might be decent on Wayfair. Let me send them like a couple pictures that I have and we'll go from there. And the problem I always have is like, that's your brand. That's your baby. Like you can't put all of your eggs in one basket. No, it, it amazes me how many sellers don't diversify. They're so reliant on Amazon. One of those, actually, one of those places I was at where I was the only marketer, over Q4 one year, there was a two-week period where we got suspended off Amazon just because we had to change our credit card and something triggered. And I had just started and I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna lose my job because this place is gonna close because they hadn't really focused as much on their website, which is why they brought me in. And I was just like, I've been here for like two months. I don't have time. It's obviously not up and running yet. And because they hadn't diversified, they were, I thought they were gonna completely close. And that's so common now. Like I still see sellers to this day. They're like, we're getting suspended because they think that we're selling a pesticide and we're not. Like I see that all the time. And so what we mean by like an omni-channel approach is essentially like, If you're going to go on a channel, whether it's your own website or it's Amazon or it's eBay or wherever, go all in, put some serious effort into your imagery. Your copy should sound the same. Your product imagery, any kind of extra content you have on there should all look the same. You should have a brand guideline. You should have a brand voice guideline. You should have a customer profile to understand who you're going after, how you're talking to them and what you want them to see. And then on top of that, the marketing approach should be the same as well. So this is, where, this is where it gets interesting because I've, I've been yelled at for this one before. And so I've had sellers before where they were basically solely on Amazon and they wanted to get away from Amazon, but they were like, I don't want to waste a ton of money on getting a Shopify site going. And it's just not like, you don't just throw it up on the internet and start making sales. It's just not that case. And so one of the things I had tested was, I was like, you know what? Why don't we 
because they wanted to still bring traffic to their Amazon. And I wanted to prove to them that their website could still convert. So I was like, why don't we take all of your ads, run all your ads to your website, but directly under your products buy now button, let's put an also available on Amazon button and have it linked directly to the listing. And so we actually tracked those two buttons separately to see which one converted the best. And they were relatively split. And I was like, okay, so you're still getting traffic to Amazon. You're uh, still getting your buy now button. So you're still getting some sales on your website. This was when I first tried this, this was before you had like the approved Amazon affiliate option where you can still get sales from yourself from off Amazon and all that. And it was also before they had the custom URL in the back of the storefront. So I couldn't track if they were getting sales or not at the time, but we could track the button through Google Analytics and Tag Manager and all that fun stuff. And so I was like, all right, now let's test getting rid of the button and just see what happens. So they got worried, got rid of the button, and their Amazon sales came down a little bit. I was like, okay, your website sales went up a little bit, but not, it wasn't complimentary. Right? Up, like it was like yeah. ah, a little too much. I'm like, okay, let's put it back. And we just left it. And we're like, all right, so we're just going to do it this way. After a while, we were able to get the Amazon custom source URL. So we actually created on their storefront landing pages for each individual product they had. So it was almost like we took them to one page that was on Amazon that was for their product without any competition on it, which is why I hated sending traffic directly to a listing. So they could still add to cart, they could purchase right there. And then they went to Walmart and then eBay. And we just added another button and kept adding another button. And one of the things we started to do... On the same product page? mm -hmm, All on the same product page. So we gave the user the option to check out wherever they were most comfortable. Now, we added a lot of bells and whistles on the website to get them to convert on the website because of obvious reasons, your margins are better. So we would add in, you know, first order on the site, get 10% off or website only offers, things like that. And we would also put the price that we had the product on Amazon, which typically to make sure that Amazon doesn't get cranky is the same price. But what we would do is we would have the price it would essentially be the same across the board. But then that way they could see like, but we're having a 10% off on our site right now and not on Amazon is essentially what you can see because like you'd have that price crossed out. So they'd be like, oh, I'm actually going to save by staying on the site. So we did a lot of incentives to keep them on the site. So on the marketing side, what we would do is we would actually, because we could track all those button clicks, we could see what people were more interested in going to. So if it got to a point where, okay, we have all these people's emails and yet they're still preferring to go to Amazon, we would actually do product launches or we would do Amazon only sales and we would send it to the email list of people that had ever clicked Amazon buttons. So that's how we knew who our customers were as that were on Amazon. So it's kind of our way of getting around Amazon. And so basically, we made sure that the consumer was allowed to shop wherever they were most comfortable and our marketing was catered to wherever they were most comfortable with shopping. That's awesome. So, okay, a couple things here. First of all, so Amazon, if you had the price marked lower on your site, is that in violation of any Amazon terms? Or could you only offer a discount with like a coupon or something? Yeah, we would typically do it with a coupon. You could sometimes say we're having like a 10% off site-wide sale sort of thing and like cross out the price and, you know, put a 10% off or whatever and leave your Amazon pricing listed as it was on the button. But I have seen in the past that they get cranky about that kind of stuff, but they don't really care as much if it's a sale that you're doing as much as they do care if it's a permanent thing. So if you're kind of advertising it to sale, they usually don't mind. I've never gotten flagged for it. Gotcha. Okay. And then, so the other thing is just, there's a lot of, you know, you hear a lot like Shopify's battle cry, like we're arming the rebels against Amazon and, mm-hmm. and a lot of that. What you're saying is sell on Shopify, sell on Amazon, sell on eBay, sell on Walmart. Customers... And I see the same thing too. Like I see a lot of merchants, they sell on every channel. It's not like one is competing against another. It's the channel that some customers want to buy on. So you're Mm -hmm. missing out if you maybe don't sell there. Yeah, there's the risk Amazon can copy your product and make it into Amazon Basics or something else. There's That does happen. But I like your strategy of driving to your site first. And if someone feels more comfortable buying from... Amazon because they are a prime member or they've gone through a return process and they just, for whatever reason, some friction has been removed. Why not give them that option, right? So do you not kind of buy into the, and not just Shopify, but like it could be any e-commerce platform like versus Amazon. You're saying it's selling all of them. I still think it kind of comes down to the I think that's case by case. I think it comes down to the product. Like I don't personally believe that like luxury and premium brands should be anywhere else but their own site. 
I think that they should control their message a lot more. They should control the customer experience a lot more. But then there's other times and there's other stuff. So like you also have the added benefit on the operational side of if for some reason your warehouse runs out of inventory, but you still have some sitting at FBA, you could just basically turn off your buy now button, still drive all the traffic to your site and let them go to Amazon if you want to do that. Or just skip Mm. the whole site, which I don't like doing because you can still retarget them, still get their email and all that fun stuff. But yeah. That way you can leverage your inventory everywhere if you have stuff sitting in FBA. Interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting strategy. And I think for the right brand and product mix, it makes sense. But I absolutely agree for luxury brands where you're trying to create an experience and the relationship with the customer that owning that 100% through and through, Mm -hmm. beginning to end, it's really important. I couldn't agree more. But like, yeah, like you said, there's a ton of examples that that's not a good approach. Like I know when I had you on my show, we talked about subscriptions, not a great move for subscriptions. I would not suggest it for them. But yeah, premium is definitely another one. On Amazon. Yeah. 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 There's two more I want to just touch on. Let's just pick the, before we run out of time here though, I thought this one was interesting. This will be my last talk. I of yours, I rip apart here. No, no. <laughs> Does your e-commerce business need a CRM? Why high volume sellers are making the switch? I thought that was interesting. I agree with the title. I'm just curious to hear. And I think, but I bet you a lot of brands actually aren't leveraging it as much as they should be a CRM. Mm-hmm. So what's the thought process here? So we are HubSpot partners. And also Mm -hmm. Klaviyo Partners, which is the two that I always see the argument over. And the reason we decided to partner with both of them is because, just like I've pretty much said this entire time, it's down to a case by case. There's situations where I would suggest a more one-on-one, highly personalized approach to your marketing than I would mass marketing like you would get through your traditional email marketing software, right? Mm -hmm. So when we have sellers that obviously have a B2B side to them. That one's kind of a no-brainer. They should definitely have a CRM. Sometimes there's situations where if they are doing a lot of smaller retail situations where they have like small mom and shop pops that their shops that they're working with or, you know, they're distributing to a bunch of smaller areas, right? Those relationships you want to keep going and you want to let them know about new stuff. And so it's kind of like prepping emails, but it's also like having that relationship managed. And so like with HubSpot, we have the added benefit of, you know, you can integrate everything together. So a lot of people use Klaviyo on Shopify. I know a lot of people are kind of catering to like gorgeous for their customer service. But if you have like a B2B side and you can justify upgrading to doing just a HubSpot, you can also, they have customer service just as much as Gorgeous does. So you can see it all in one place. So you can kind of get an understanding, especially from your customer service side of being able to see like, all right, we have a ticket open with this person, but let me see what else they've done. Okay, they've opened this email. They've interacted with this social ad. They've, They've done all this stuff. They've visited this page. And so there's a lot of stuff like that where it's kind of more, if there's a situation where you need to manage a one on one relationship, it's absolutely ideal. And then sometimes we have had it where it's a very traditional like direct-to-consumer, nothing crazy seller that prefers Shopify just because you can have your marketing team and your customer service team all in one place and gorgeous and like Klaviyo and getting reporting all in one area is kind of a pain. So they can kind of get everything in one spot and they don't want to be juggling 15 different apps. There is obviously a price difference if it's something that someone's looking at. And usually what we try to do is we look at like, all right, what's your customer service portal? Are you using like a scheduling software for social media? What's your email marketing software? Okay, can you let me know exactly what you're paying for all those each month? And I go, okay, here's what HubSpot's going to cost you. And then if it's more or if it's less, we try. If it's less, then do it. If it's more, then it's kind of like, okay, here's what the added cost is going to be. What type of extra value are you going to get out of this that you're not all already getting, excluding the obvious, which is aggregating it all into one place. So we'll kind of go through like a process of where is this beneficial for you. But there's a lot on HubSpot, especially from like a landing page point of view, where you can have copy on the site or imagery on your site or anything like that, that can change based on who's visiting the site because you have all that data in one place. So we really like creating the landing pages and stuff on HubSpot and giving them the option to basically go straight to there so that we can kind of personalize the message a lot more. So you also look at like what other apps you might have if you're using like a page fly or something like that, that also would not be necessary. 
But usually it's if there's like a one-on-one relationship with either B2B or like retailers or something like that that you still need to keep up with. Yeah. And then you touched on this, but the added benefit of having, you know, you can create all your HubSpot dashboards and analytics and have kind of good insight into what's happening. And we use HubSpot and it's Mm -hmm. fantastic. I agree 100%. You definitely have to be at a bit of a certain level. Make sure you know when you sign up for HubSpot, talk to the sales rep at the end of the month, you'll usually get a discount. <laughs> but, yeah, but exactly. Yeah, couldn't, <laughs> couldn't agree more. Or with a partner, we can get you a discount too. Or, there, it out you, there. there you go. <laughs> hey, you know what? We're not a partner. I'll put your link in our show notes. Right? Is that <laughs> how it works? Or they got to go, go through you? <laughs> no, nah, they got to go through me, which is oh, okay. a right. pain, but it's easy. I could just, honestly, I, there's been so many times where they're like, we don't need marketing help, but we want HubSpot. Can you help us out? I'm like, yeah, sure. I was like, here's my rep. And I go, hey, we're working with them. And he goes, oh, okay, cool. And then he sells them and I never talk to him again. <laughs> okay, if you're listening, help Andrew out. Contact him if you need HubSpot. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Andrew, this has been really, really insightful. I think there is a ton here for a lot of our listeners. If someone wants to follow you and like all your posts and comments and learn more about you, where do you want to send people? All of my social is at Andrew Maff and all of Blue Tusker's social is at Blue Tusker. B-L-U-E-T-U-S-K-R. There's no E in Tusker. No E. (laughs) Was it taken? No. (laughs) There's a reason it's not in there. I'll I'll tell you off the air. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So Blue Tusker, no E is how you find him. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. (laughs) Yeah, thank you. That's it for another episode of Own Your Commerce. If what you've heard has helped you in any way, I'd love it if you'd leave us a review in iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast. It's a new podcast and reviews really help spread the word. And if you know someone you think that might benefit from this podcast, share it with a friend. If you'd like to learn more about Bold, visit boldcommerce.com. You can view all our past episodes. And if you have a story you'd like to tell, we'd love to have you on the show. You can apply to be a guest or suggest a guest on our website as well. That's all for now. And we'll see you next week. 